Behind the Ticker is brought to you by UX Wealth Partners. If you're a TAMP user and you're sick and tired of the legacy technology they are run on and you want more customization and flexibility, as well as a AI-driven model marketplace, UX Wealth Partners is your destination. On top of that, they have institutional trading. So if you are an ETF issuer or an SMA provider looking for outsourced institutional trading, UX Wealth can also be your destination. So check out uxwp.com to find out all the ways UX Wealth Partners can help grow and make your practice more efficient. Welcome to Behind the Ticker. Today we have on Springer Harris. He is the author of the book, Get ETF, an insider's guide to starting and running an ETF. So we had a great little chat talking about what it takes to get an ETF to market. He has an extensive amount of experience in the industry. So we talk about all the different options when getting started, navigating through all the different decisions that need to be made. We talk about marketing. We talk about patience. We talk about the entrepreneurship of the whole thing. So if you're thinking about starting an ETF or you're new to the ETF industry, I think this would be a great listen. So please enjoy this episode with Mr. Springer Harris. Hey, Springer. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for having me. So before we get started, always like to get a little bit about your background, uh, what you're doing today, and how eventually you decided uh, to write Get ETF, a, a practical guide to starting and running an ETF. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm lucky enough to have spent basically my entire career uh, in the ETF industry and rare enough that I've actually spent that whole time at the same firm. Um, out of college, uh, I was actually invited to join Tucrium. Uh, at that point, I didn't even know what an ETF was and Tucrium hadn't even launched its first fund. Um, and so I wanted to have a little bit more stability in life. And so I started to go down the corporate route, um, went into a major PR firm, major global PR firm, started working on emergent social media. I didn't even know what Twitter was when I started working there, right? And we're doing that for super large, you know, Fortune 500 firms. About a year into that, I realized, you know, if I, you know, put my head down, grind real hard, 10 years from now, I could be that guy in that office there. And that's about as far as I was going to get. And so I called Tukriam and I said, hey, does the offer still stand? Um, they had one fund out at that point. I said, uh, you know, this is really what I want to do. And so I've been doing that now for 14 years. Um, the portfolio manager and chief operating officer at Tukriam now. And it's been a really exciting run for us. Um, but like any ETF issuer out there, uh, if you've been in the game for a little while, you've definitely had someone come to you and ask you, how did you do that? How did you launch your ETF? How would I do it myself? And to Korean, we've always had an open door policy. We've always talked to asset managers to make sure that we were being as helpful as we possibly could. And that sort of organically developed into providing um, sub-advisory services and support services for other funds. And what I noticed, though, is that more and more people were coming to me, especially back in like 2022, um, wanting to know basically the same, they had the same questions. Everyone had the same questions. How do I start this ETF? What do I do? What are the different paths? How long does it take? How much does it cost? Right. And I found myself just spending hours answering the same questions for folks, which struck me as an opportunity. And so I was invited onto a podcast back then to talk about how to start an alt CTF. And I spent a lot of time framing out how I was going to talk about that, how I was going to present it. And I thought like, great, this is this awesome piece of evergreen content that I'm going to be able to make and help people start ETFs, right? This wasn't about having a business or making money or doing anything. I really just wanted to find a way to make my mark on the ETF industry, a way to you know, raise the tide for everyone. And, and the way that we do that is to empower entrepreneurs to push the limits of what the ETF wrapper is capable of, right? That's where we're going to find it. So I wanted to make sure that that basic information was out there. And so it was on the podcast. It was really great. Um, and literally the next day we're driving and uh, we're actually, we're in the jungle. We're coming back from Panama. It's just me and my wife. And I look at my wife and I say, I'm going to write a book. And she laughs. I mean, she laughs at me, like belly laugh, like couldn't believe it. Like there is no way, Springer, like you can barely get through an email. You're not going to write a book. We got home that night and I literally just put hands to keyboard and started writing and just 
pretty much poured my soul and everything I could think of about ETFs into this book for about nine months and went through the whole process. And we can talk about that. But it really was just a, you know, me wanting to put out there and speak to the entrepreneur about what did it means to be an ETF issuer. Yeah, no, that's great. And um, I certainly have gotten a lot of those questions as well. Now you can just hand your book over instead of uh, instead of answering all the questions. But before we kind of get into, you know, starting an ETF, how it all works, I always like to ask everybody, uh, when you're not working, what do you like to do outside the office? Any hobbies? Yeah, man. So I'm an outdoors guy, right? But I like clean outdoors guy. So it's all water for me. Um, I live in Vermont and all my friends, they basically spend all their time in the mountains. Um, I spend mine on the lake. Um, we've got a sailboat, motorboat. Um, basically, if I'm not in the office, um, sun up to sundown, we try to get out on the lake as, as much as we can. And when it's cold, um, I'm in the water as well. So just getting out there, surfing as much as I can, salt water. Um, so definitely a water guy. So let's talk about just at the high level ETFs. Like, What makes the ETF structure so appealing for an asset manager, but also the end investor? So I think what it comes down to, right, is we, we've got, we've put a lot of pressure on the ETF where it's almost become like it's the only vehicle. And right, it's not, but it is quickly becoming everybody's favorite vehicle in the sense that the, the intraday liquidity and the ability to control your own investment with inside your brokerage account and get access to all these different types of strategies, all these markets that were otherwise uh, previously potentially unaccessible, or there was a lot of friction in trying to uh, access them, that was one piece, right? And we've done a really good job at, as an industry, educating end users on the features of ETFs, how they work, why you would use them. But let's be honest, right? That was pretty self-serving education. We did that so that more people would adopt the ETF as an investor and we would all have more investors in our funds, right? That we needed to do it. And there's still a lot of education left to do, which is why you still see ETF issuers posting regularly about how does an ETF work? What's a creation or redemption, right? There's still a lot more of that to do. But the audience that was neglected during this was the asset manager who could bring out more ETFs, right? When we all started to form, you know, build our ETF businesses, White labels didn't exist. Multi-series trust didn't exist. You had to come out. You had to build the entire infrastructure yourself. And that created a barrier to entry. But then the other thing that we did is we put barriers to entry up about how you do it. So that's where we lost educating the public was how they work from the inside, what the folks like us have to do when we're running those funds. And I think that once we've started to lower the barriers to entry, we've started to flatten the learning curve for how they work. Asset managers are starting to realize this is a fantastic way to put my strategy because it makes my job a little bit easier. I'm not managing maybe a bunch of SMAs, uh, you know, whatever those types of things that you're packaging up into the ETF makes your like sort of operational life easier. But now all of a sudden, the ecosystem for your customer is anybody with a brokerage account, right? As long as you can get your fund on the platform, as long as a person can sign into their brokerage account, type in your ticker and click buy, they're a potential customer. And so it changes the landscape of who you can market to. I mean, let's be honest, right? In the, in the ETF space, when we're marketing, you're marketing to everyone all the time. You don't know who's purchasing your fund and you don't know when you put out a piece of content or education who that's actually going to trigger. Well, if you take about a small asset manager with... Um, you know, maybe a hundred million dollars in SMAs, all of a sudden now their strategy is available for basically the whole world to purchase. Like that's a huge opportunity, right? Yeah, of course. And you touched on this slightly. I think one of the things that people have a fear, especially when you're talking to SMA managers, is they it used to be, you know, a fairly heavy lift to get these things to market. So can you talk about how that landscape has changed to kind of make the process of getting to market a little bit easier? Yeah. It, so the way that I structure the book, right, is to basically talk to the, I, I talked to the entrepreneur. When I was writing the book, I was, I had the picture of myself, you know, someone like you, Brad, like starting a business from scratch and speaking to the entrepreneurial spirit with inside the asset manager. And a part of that is to explain that there are multiple ways that you can bring an ETF to market. And it's about looking at your business plan, your long-term goals, what you want to do. 
And so when you look at that, you really got three ways. One, you can build your own business. And there's a lot of reasons why you would want to do that. There's also a few of the reasons how you wouldn't. On the other side of that spectrum, you have a bunch of new entrants, you know, me included, that have white label businesses where you can basically just bring your uh, strategy to the table, um, bring cap enough capital, to launch it. It's much cheaper to do it that way because the economy is a scale. And you have an established business basically just present you with a turnkey operations, regulatory, everything you need. You can be out in 75 days off to the races, right? And then in the middle, there's this a lot of different ways that you can build a hybrid business where you can use a multi-series trust. You can have more control over your business. You can be the advisor and you kind of can create the best of both worlds depending on uh, what you want the outcome of your business plan to look like. And so oftentimes when I talk with aspiring ETF sponsors and issuers, um, I always try to get everyone to take a step back and, and really look at their business plan and say, where do you want to go? What are the different ways that this might evolve? Don't just look at this as asset management. You have to look at this as any entrepreneur would in their business. Um, and when you start to look at it like that and you think about your own goals and your plans, um, what makes you excited to come to work in the morning, you can figure out really what the best path for you. So when you're talking to you know advisors that are making that decision, like what would, what would uh, kind of shift your advice to say, hey, look, why don't you build your own trust? Let's get let's do everything soup to nuts, control your destiny there. And then what would kind of make you say, hey, like, I think the white labeling approach is right for you. White label is definitely good for an advisor or asset manager that has one strategy, two strategies. Um, they really haven't um, learned much about how the ETF ecosystem works and frankly, don't care to. Um, they want to focus on what they do best. They want to manage uh, their strategy, uh, and they want to go out and market their fund, right? And if that's all you want to do, then the white label's great for you. Um, you have to recognize that you're going to get those efficiencies, but on the other side, you know, you're you're paying a whole team of people to do all the work for you. And so when you do less, you make less, right? That's just anything, right? You don't mow your own lawn, um, you have to pay for it. If you mow your own lawn, you get to keep that money, right? That's basic, at the simplest level, that's what it is. And so if you want to if you're a really go-getter entrepreneur and you want to build an enterprise, um, something with you know significant value that you may want to exit from and you want to sell, um, if you want to manage a team of people, if you want to um, you know get the brain calluses to go through this business and figure out who are the best partners to work with, constantly making changes. Um, and bring out, most importantly, I mean, an entire suite of product. If you want to build a brand and a whole suite of products, then, you know, do it yourself is, is the way to go. There's a lot of um, empowerment, a lot of pride that comes with building a whole ETF business, um, but it's hard and, and it's expensive. And so you really have to be committed to the ETF game for the long term uh, in your business plan versus, you know, just wanting to build um, strategies. So you touched on this is, you know, for those people that are in kind of doing it theirself, um, finding the best partner. So there are many choices that come after, you know, deciding to launch an ETF, like who your service provider is, what exchange you're going to list on, who's going to be your lead market maker, right? All these different things. Yep. So how do you kind of advise someone or kind of coach them through navigating some of these decisions? Because there's a ton of options out there. Yeah, I mean, that's one of that's a whole chapter in the book, right? So, you know, building your team, you know, so you've decided that, you know, first chapter basically just teaches you here are the basic terminology that we use inside the industry, right? Because um, any industry, if you're a doctor, whatever it is, like I'm on the board at the hospital, right? The doctors use vocabulary that I don't understand. And when they do that, they label you as an outsider. And it's just natural human tendency to do that in every business, every culture, every you know, sport, subculture, whatever it is, we have a vocabulary that we use and it's a way of establishing insiders and outsiders. And at, at its basic core, that's just what we do as humans. And so in the ETF industry, we're no different. And so the first thing I do is I teach the aspiring ETF sponsor the vocabulary that they can use when they enter into a conversation with someone like you or me or a service provider. Because if you don't have that, all of a sudden you don't have the confidence to be a part of the conversation and you don't feel like you're an insider. And so 
you got to have that confidence to just step up to the table and actually have the conversation. But then, okay, I'm confident. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do that. But now who do I have the conversation with? I don't even know what I need. And so we, I build out in the chapters, basically internal teams versus external teams. No ETF business can operate 100% internal. It's not possible. You have external partners in different parts of that ecosystem. It's a requirement. And I lay out basically how you can build the smallest team or the biggest team internally, right? And minimally, I mean, you can be a one-man shop, but if you're going to build your own ETF business, you need to be at least three people. I mean, that's, you have to be. And then you look at, if you're going to outsource everything, who do you need and what are the major roles that need to be played, right? So I go down and I list who though, not who they are, but what the roles are, right? I don't mention any businesses in my book at all. I did that on purpose, right? And you go through that, Then when you start to dive into it and you start to Google, okay, who's a fund administrator? Who's a distributor? Who does this? Who does that? Now you're just left with a ton of choices. And so if you're going to enter and start to build your own business, it's probably worthwhile um, to find a consultant. Find, you know, a consultant is a really good way to do that. I do that for people. Um, Or just start to make friends with inside the industry who can basically give you referrals of who works from, you know, who who I've chosen and why. And that's kind of how the ETF industry works, right? There's a few different centers of influence um, that basically get everybody the business. The attorneys um, usually start, right? You, you hire an attorney and the attorney knows different people and they say, talk to this person, talk to that person. Or you pick one of your first, uh, you know, one of your first um, service providers, your administrator, your distributor, and they start to give you a web, right? And now you've gotten introductions to these firms, but how do you choose? Um, they're essentially providing the same service, uh, but they're going to do it differently and they're going to charge differently. And so one piece is definitely price. You have to keep price in mind. We always do any decision we make in life and business, you'd keep price in mind. But the thing that I really instill in people in the book and in my conversations is that when you're choosing a partner, choose them the same way that you would hire inside your business. In the same the same level of diligence that you would do before you allowed someone to show up physically in your office and work for you every day, do that with your service providers because they will be working for you, your funds, your investors every single day. These need to be people that are easy to communicate with, you enjoy communicating with, uh, that you uh, want to celebrate your successes with, but that you can also give feedback to when it's time because you know this is a challenging business. And we all have to give each other, you know, negative feedback sometimes about the way things are going. And you need to have a group of people who are going to work with you in that and they want to see your success. And so the biggest piece of advice that I can give there is really choose your business partners, every, your service providers, as if you were choosing business partners and employees. Um, but also, don't be afraid to let them go either. You're not stuck. You're never stuck with any of your service providers. Um, so it, it's, a, it's very difficult to change. It can be painful. Uh, it can be time consuming. But, you know, I mean, I've changed almost every service provider we've had over the years. And it's a healthy thing to do. Uh, and you, you really uh, you have to be open to it. Yeah, I mean, that's really great advice because you, you think you're just picking a service provider based on, okay, let's, let's get our margins as high as we possibly can. But in reality, you end up spending a lot of time with these people. You see them around. Um, and you see them at conferences, you're talking to them sometimes, you know, daily or weekly. So it's definitely important to, to find service providers that you enjoy working with, even if they are maybe a little bit more expensive. And I think too, you end up, once you create that relationship, you end up getting a better le- le- level of service, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, if you've been in the ETF industry long enough, you know, I think, I mean, you've had so many people on this show, right? It is an amazing community. I, I think it's the best community in finance. I think everybody that's in ETFs would say the same thing. Um, it's an ETF family. And you can see that when we all get together at the different conferences, just how excited we are to be around each other, not even necessarily talking about business. Uh, and so if you're looking at entering the ETF industry, you have to recognize from the beginning that you are you are stepping into an extremely close-knit family. Uh, it's a growing family, but it's still pretty small. I mean, it, it's it, we all know each other, and it, having those having those relationships with the people that you work with uh, is is critical. And, you know, staying on that for a minute, that was one of the things that surprised me the most about entering the ETF industry when we did a couple of years ago, because 
the other parts of finance can sometimes be a little bit cutthroat and a little bit ugly. And again, I mean, there's a lot of entrants in this space. It, it is crowded, but everybody is willing to help and is is willing to work together in some capacity. Because I think there's a feeling that you know the the industry has been growing rapidly, but it's you know it's like a rising tide lifts all boats, right? And I think we're all in it together. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it the, the thing that makes it so cool is that not only, I mean, there is no doubt it is hyper competitive, right? Like if you've got an idea for an ETF, you have to assume two other people have the same idea and they're working on it harder and faster than you are. That's what gives you that fire to actually come to market. Uh, that race, you have to race yourself because you're assuming other people are coming with you, right? At the same time, I think you or I could call anybody in the ETF industry and ask them a question. Who are you using for this? How did you do that? I'm really curious about this. Every one of us will give up the answer, right? And so we'll help each other to succeed while also being, I mean, extraordinarily competitive. But that's the difference between competition and being cutthroat, right? I don't see the ETF industry as cutthroat. Right. Uh, and that's why I love being a part of it. So it's getting back to kind of starting uh, starting an ETF. Someone comes to you, what is the number one misconception that you hear all the time when people are trying to enter this space? That everything can be an ETF. You know? I mean, that's like everybody has this idea and they're like, I want to put it into an ETF. And it's like, all right, we can push the boundaries of what the ETF can do, but not everything can be an ETF, right? You really have to look at it and you have to look at the parameters of what the wrapper can do. And some types of strategies are just better for a closed end fund or a hedge fund or an SMA, right? I mean, I've had folks come to me and they say, um, you know, I might make anywhere between zero and a thousand trades intraday, but I start the day with cash and I end the day with cash. And it's like, dude, that can't be an ETF. Like, right. stop, you know? And it's, so it's this misconception that everything can be an ETF. That's one. And then two is that um, if I build it, they will come, right? If I put it into an ETF wrapper, I'm going to make a whole bunch of AUM and therefore I'm going to make a bunch of management fee. And that couldn't be further from the truth, right? We all know that. Um, you can build the best ETF, um, and they're not going to come. And so when I talk with uh, different entrepreneurs, the thing that I, I wouldn't say it's a misconception. I think the thing that surprises them the most is when I say they need to have a three-year business plan. And I wrote that in the book and I make that a, you know, basically a requirement for folks that I work with is that if you're going to come into the ETF space, you need to have cash flow to support your ETF for three years. Uh, because far too often I talk to entrepreneurs who say, I've saved up enough money, we've got enough cash flow, um, but this has to work in 12 months. 12 months, I need to be above break even. I'm not bringing any assets to the table, right? So we're going to start at seed, two and a half million, and I need to be up at 50 million in 12 months or I'm out, we're closing. And I, you can't do that. It is, is way too risky. I mean, the capital that you're going to put on the table to start that ETF um, and say that you 100% have to be at break even in, in 12 months or you're out of the game, it's too risky. So you have to look at it and you have to say, this is a three-year business plan. I'm going to support this ETF through tough times for three years, you know, plus or minus. I mean, you know, if you hit it at two and a half, I mean, this isn't like an exact science, but you need to have a long-term view of success in your ETF. And I think that is the sobering reality and conversation uh, that I find where people really then step back and start to evaluate their business plan. So it's great. Let's let's stay on this for a little bit. So um, I was going to ask that question, how much capital would you say you need to sustain and kind of grow this thing? So you kind of kind of gave me that three years. Uh, but the build, if you build it, they will come is is the number one thing that I hear. And when I talk to people, I have to explain like that is it, just because the ticker goes live, you're not going to get flow. So how would you approach marketing kind of in the first one and two years of a fund launch? And then all of a sudden you've got a three-year track record. And so, you know, that's a big milestone and kind of how would you approach, you know, once you get to that three-year mark, how would you approach continuing to kind of get momentum and continue to grow? So. In, in Get ETF, right, I walk through a very linear path of coming to market, right? Learning the terms, uh, coming, you know, coming, you know, coming up with a good idea, vetting it against the marketplace, all the, you know, all the components of having a good idea. Then we go through the build out your team, regulatory structures, getting through filing, getting up through launch, 
all that, right? Not that that's easy, but it's it's a tried and true path, right? Anyone anyone with enough dedication and support can get through that path. But once you're standing there on the New York Stock Exchange and the bell goes off and your family's clapping for you and you go to dinner that night and you celebrate and you wake up the next morning, that's when like the real work begins, right? You, you just spent you know six months bringing this to this point, and now you're actually at the starting line. And at the starting line, you've got two things you have to do. One, you have to operate this thing day in and day out. Um, on the other side, you also have to grow it day in and day out. And in the ETF industry, there isn't a single person here who has the ideal formula worked out for how you market an ETF. Because if you did, you wouldn't be working in the ETF industry. You'd be owning your own island. You'd be sitting out there and you'd be sipping margaritas. Because you'd be worth tens of billions of dollars because that's what we're all looking for is what works in marketing in this industry. And my colleague says it best, Jake Hanley, he's our head of marketing here. Everything works and nothing works. And that's the most frustrating part about ETS is you have to do everything and none of it's ever going to feel like it's working because no single thing that you do is the golden ticket. You're not going to be able to look at one single action and say, that made me five million. That made me 10 million. It doesn't work like that. It's an entire strategy for marketing that you run month to month, year to year, and you build. You build not only your track record in terms of performance, but you build your brand. You build trust. You build relationships. That is really where a lot of this is. And then also, it's time in market. I mean, you and I have both seen really great ETFs close right before their time would have been, you know, they close down and then whatever market that they were invested in just explodes. And it's like, oh, you missed it because you just didn't stay in the game long enough. And then we've also seen ETFs that are timed perfectly, right? They come out, they had no intent of being a unicorn and it's just timed as a miraculous miracle. And and they're one of the unicorns that go down in ETF history, right? But that's not what most of us are going to experience. And so at the early stages, it's about setting your brand, establishing who you are, being, um, you know, it, being honest about who you are, being authentic and getting that education out there that not only your fund exists, but what it does. And you have to recognize that when you're doing that, you're, you're fighting for not assets, you're fighting for attention, right? Every one of us is our attention is being pulled by our phones all day long by every consumer product, whatever it might be. Um, and so you're fighting for that attention to be known and then once you start to actually get some momentum, then you can start to go and have a lot more one-on-one conversations with advisors and investors and so forth. But uh, if anybody tries to sell you the golden ticket, they don't have it. I'm not going to say that I am a marketer, right? I'm an ops guy. Uh, I, you know, I love ETFs. I love building. Um, you know, I had to market my own book. That's been a lot of fun, right? Building my own brand. And so like, that's really one of the things that I can speak to, right, is having to build a brand for myself as an individual, build a brand for um, my book and my business, get ETF. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And then on the individual side in ETFs, right, there's a lot of really great teams out there that can, that can help folks come up with brands um, if you don't want to do it yourself. Um, and then oftentimes, you know, with the older established businesses, um, we've kind of evolved over time, right? When I think about branding, you're not you're not the sign you put on the door. Your brand is who you are and the experience that people have with you and what they think about you. And so, you know, think about a grocery store, right? You've got a logo on the door. That's not your brand. The brand is what the grocery store looks like, what it feels like to shop there, how happy you are when you walk out the door, how you were treated. Those are the things that an ETF company should focus on, right? You can spend a ton of money getting a really cute, logo and super high tech website and all this other kind of stuff um, that is important on the surface. But if it's not backed up with culture, it's worth nothing. And so for me, when I think about what builds an ETF business, it's when an investor calls you, answer the phone. When somebody sends you an email through your email and says, I'm interested in this, email them back immediately. Uh, that's the level of service that people are not accustomed to. I don't even think in the ETF industry. And so if you can do something like that to set yourself apart, you're everything. And that's something that, you know, at Tukri, I mean, that we work a lot on that. Um, if you call us and you leave a voicemail, you're going to get a call back from somebody in 30 minutes. And it's going to be the person who can answer your question. It's not going to be a call center. 
Um, if you shoot us a note on email or you send us something through social media, you're going to get the person who has the answer and they're going to get back to you immediately. Those are really important things to do. Um, and so when you're coming out and you establish yourself, be authentic, set your brand. The ET, you know, lucky enough, we're an ETF. So like we're not stuffy, you know, um, we all are who we are. We've got lives and we bring those lives to the office and we work hard. Um, just be a real human being and treat your customers and your investors the same way. Meet them where they're at, help them, educate them. Um, but you know, just be available. And all too often, you just don't find people that are. We've just got a culture where we ignore emails, we don't answer phones. Um, and uh, frankly, it, it's just not okay. Yeah. And to going back to your point about having, you know, a three year plan and operational budget, like it's not just operations. You got to include in that budget, right? PR. Uh, if you're going to do, you know, Pulse, if you're going to do, you know, outsource distribution, or if you're going to bring that internal, if you're going to have someone help you with social, your website, like all of these things need to be included in that because it adds up quickly and they're monthly ongoing expenses. And there, you're, you also said something else that I couldn't agree more with is you have no idea where money is coming from and what has worked and sparked someone's interest. So you kind of have to do all of it. Okay. Um, so let's yeah. talk it about... Is, it is the most frustrating thing. It sure it's is. the most frustrating thing. You bang your head against the wall trying to figure out what it works. And you feel like you're just cutting checks all day, every day in marketing. Uh, and you want to optimize that. And, and you can to an extent, but it takes a long time to figure that out. And so working with folks who have done it before uh, is really important, right? Like any of us who have been in the industry for long enough, um, you know, we've made some bad marketing choices. We've made some bad marketing deals. We all have and we learn from them. And so, you know, don't just buy everything you're sold. You know, there's a lot of really great ETF marketers out there. And there's a lot of people that are just, you know, they're, they're selling false hope. Yeah, I would agree with that. So uh, let's staying on marketing for a minute. One of the biggest uh, gripes I get from asset managers who are getting into the ETF space is they're frustrated by what they can and cannot say because of, you know, distribution and, and compliance. So how do you try to set someone's expectation going in that, you know, this isn't the Wild West and you got to be careful about what you say? Yeah, no doubt. Right. We all have that challenge. Um, you know, we're not we're not selling sneakers. You know, I mean, we're we're selling asset management and we've got a high bar that we have to hit um, both operationally um, and from a compliance aspect when you're talking about people. I mean, this is this is people's money you're talking about and it's important and we have a lot of rules. Um, trust me, I know that. Uh, the SEC was in my office for the, you know, Monday and Tuesday because we've got our, you know, periodic audit. Um, and so it's, it's very fresh in my mind, this topic. Um, there's a science to it. And there is a way that you can do a lot and still remain very compliant. Um, is it frustrating? Yes. Might it take twice as long, three times as long uh, to produce that piece of content? Absolutely. But you can do it. Luckily, a lot of people who are thinking about starting an ETF, they're not Wild West um, it, it sort of uh, culture because they're probably coming from a background in finance anyway. The people who kind of think about that is, this, is the person who's still quite a far away from launch. Like they've got like a back test idea on their Excel sheet and they've never managed any money before. And, you know, they've got a long road to go before that ETF actually comes out to market and they'll learn that. Um, but any of us that have been in finance for any period of time, we recognize how difficult it is. But as the environment evolves, especially with online advertising, um, there's a lot of ways that, that you can get your message across. And I'm really excited about these suite of products that are coming out that are um, geared towards finance from the compliance side uh, that are basically like compliance chat GPT, right? Where you can spend less time, less of your own time trying to make sure that something is written just perfectly. Uh, we can move a lot faster. I mean, you could even do like, you know, voice to type, get a piece of content out there, throw it through some of these tools, and it gives it back to you 100% fully compliant. The SEC is going to be good with it. FINRA is going to be good with it, right? And so um, time to market and content is really important. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we face. Not None of us, none of us want to go out there and make false promises about what we produce, right? No one, I mean, some people do that and they get in trouble for it. But nobody that's really in this game is doing anything like that. Your reputation is way too important. Uh, but time in producing compliant material is difficult. 
And so I think as some of these different firms that are producing AI tools to solve that problem for us, um, I think you're going to see a lot more content getting produced and it'll, it'll lower the, the learning curve for newer entrants on how to produce compliant material. Love that. I didn't know that those existed. So I'll be doing a Google search after, uh, after <laughs> our podcast here. Yeah, they're, but, they're, so, they're impressive. They're impressive. So let's talk about the, you know, kind of finally, we've talked about starting an ETF. We've talked about picking partners. We've talked about marketing. You alluded to this a little bit, but like, when is it time to say, okay, the show's over and I need to shut it down? I've shut down ETFs. We all have. Um, it sucks. I mean, it's like going to a funeral. You know, you've you've put so much time and effort and money um, into just getting to the point where you launch it. Um, you put so much effort into running it. Uh, all the stress, the time. Uh, you know, it, this industry it, it's, it takes a lot. I mean, you, it takes a lot out of you. You get tired, and to shut something down that didn't work is just it. It sucks. And there's no other way to say it because you had high hopes for it. You would have never launched it if you didn't have high hopes. And so what it, you have to sort of admit that you fail and that's okay. Um, it's okay in the ETF industry because it doesn't mean you failed as an ETF issuer. It means that strategy didn't work. And simply by coming to market, running it, doing everything that you could, um, you know, you've, you learn from it and you apply that to your next strategy. And so it's it's really no different than any other business, right? The people who have been the most successful in this industry are the ones that stay at it. They find a way to stay in business, cut their losses when they have to, and keep focusing on the next step forward. And it is an entrepreneurial journey. And, and that's why I look at the ETF industry in, in two different lights, right? I call it the, the 60 and the 40, right? You've got the 40% of issuers at the top, the major banks, the large institutions, they're running ETFs in a totally different way, right? They will cull ETFs like it is nothing. They don't care. They have they can afford, you know, to throw the spaghetti at the wall as as we all say and see what sticks. Let the other ones go. The entrepreneur, we don't have that. Um, we don't have that luxury, right? When we choose something, we chose it and we put a lot behind it in order to do that. And that's where I like to focus my effort, my time. Uh, is on the bottom 60. It's a different ETF industry for me, right? The entrepreneurs and the large corporations, I cut the line and I say, we're we're not even operating in the same industry, even though we, we operate the same wrapper, right? And yeah, I mean, I've closed plenty of ETFs for clients. I've closed ETFs for our own firm. Um, you just, you have to know when to do it. And sometimes it, it, you can take it too far. And then when you just have a zombie ETF that just exists out in the marketplace, um, it's pretty hard to come back from that after you've gone too long with no assets or, or poor performance. Yeah. Well, Springer, I can't thank you enough uh, for being here. Before, um, before I let you go, where can people learn more about you? Where can people find the book and um, you know, get themselves a copy? Absolutely. So uh, I self-published the book, which was its own journey in and of itself. Um, so it's available on Amazon. Uh, you can get it in uh, Kindle or uh, in print. Um, very active on LinkedIn. So basically just taking a lot of that content, turning it into micro content, trying to educate the whole community uh, one step at a time. Uh, just like this podcast, I get to write on uh, ETF Central. And so break out a lot of topics there on ETF Central. But I'm always available um, on LinkedIn. Uh, and then my website, just get ETF or how to start an ETF.com. Uh, you can find different ways to uh, either get on my schedule or, or get a copy of the book. Well, again, Springer, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you being here with me today. Oh, man. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.